Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the sixth installation of Coming Clean with the Dirty Dozen, where we put the finest explorers in your living room twice a week. My name is Aaron Angramson, and I'm going to be your host tonight. And uh, before we uh, introduce uh, our special guest tonight, I just want to go behind the scenes and uh, say hello to uh, Vic and Jeff. Guys, are you are you there? Hey, Aaron. Hey. How's it going? Hey, Aaron. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> so, 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 Jeff, how, how's it going over there in Jeff's though? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. It was my birthday yesterday, which is, uh, you know, always fun when you can't leave <laughs> Happy the house. Happy birthday, but... Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. You can see all the helium balloons there in your office. Yeah, it's fun what you can do with some uh, diving grade helium and some cave line. <laughs> some very expensive balloons you have there. Why are you wasting yeah. it on balloons, Jeff? Uh, it's the last dregs of the cylinder, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, having said that, Vic, what about you? How are you doing? All good in the head. Thanks very much, Aaron. And, and don't isn't it your birthday in like four hours? Oh, yeah. Party time. And so I it's like 30 dozen team party tonight. Birthday party. <laughs> Woohoo! Happy birthday, both of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, so obviously, Aaron. Jeff takes care of the production back in Chepstow. He's doing all the tech. And Vic is taking care of all the producing, the content creation, keeping all those donkeys in check. Uh, but remember, uh, you can ask our guests uh, questions during the live stream. And Vic is going to chime in and, and ask them for you. Uh, but before I bring our special guests on board, I just want to tell you, give you a little bit of an introduction what Dirty Dozen is, if you uh, don't know who we are just yet. So normally, we are an expedition company. And we take people to Truck Lagoon, Bikini Atoll, Galapagos, Myanmar, Chernobyl. You name it, we're, we're all over the shop. But uh, right now we're not, obviously due to the COVID-19 situation. We're all hiding between the four walls of our home, but uh, we love our diamond community. Our customers are the best and our upcoming customers are, are the best too. And we, we just wanna reach out to you guys, try and lift the, keep the spirits high and uh, just have some fun. So uh, without any further ado, I want to do a bit of an introduction of our two guests tonight, Stephen Whelan and Mark Evans. Okay. So Stephen Whelan is the founder and publisher of DeeperBlue.com, one of the world's largest online communities for freedivers and scuba divers. After his first diving experience at eight years old, Stephen founded DeeperBlue.com 24 years ago. On the other hand, Scuba Diver Magazine's editor, uh, editor-in-chief, Mark Evans, has been in the diving industry for nearly 25 years and has been diving since he was just 12 years old. 35 odd years later, and he's still addicted to the underwater world. <laughs> and with that lovely picture in the background, I'd like to welcome Steve and Mark. Where are you guys? <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. There's <laughs> such a lovely photo there. At the end. It was not me, I promise. <laughs> it was Mr. Evans, I suspect. Yeah, I expected. I, that. I'll take the fifth. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Uh, where are you right now? I'll let Steve go first on that one. Okay, so I, I'm in uh, in London, southwest London, uh, stuck at home uh, with. Uh, with my wife Vicky and my three kids, um, trying to just keep sane uh, in this slightly crazy, uh, tumultuous time. And I'm up in the sticks. Uh, I'm in rural Shropshire on the Welsh border um, with my wife and our 13 and a half year old son, who we are attempting to homeschool while also trying to stay sane, um, which is very interesting to say the least. And uh, yeah, I truly value teachers even more than I did before. Um, <laughs> I mean, my dad was a teacher for 40 years, so I knew how hard they worked. But believe me, after a couple of weeks of trying to homeschool a teenager, I wouldn't want a room full of them. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so, Stephen, uh, what, what is lockdown like where you are? We've been talking to guests from all over the world uh, in our previous five episodes. So uh, people are always interested in how, how lockdown is. So how is it like in the UK? Uh, so, you know, like a lot of people who are probably watching, um, you know, I'm used to being on planes, trains, automobiles all over the place. So being uh, stuck in one place is quite unusual. Um, we're, we're all, we're all surviving pretty well. As, uh, as Mark says, uh, we have a newfound respect for 
uh, teachers. Um, and, uh, my, you know, my, my little ones luckily are being very, very uh, well behaved. Uh, and uh, no, none of us have wanted to murder each other yet, which is a um, which is a good sign. Um, but it's tough, right? We spend a lot of time doing this sort of stuff. Um, you know, being on video calls uh, at all hours of day and night, talking to colleagues and friends and uh, people in Diamond Street all around the world. So um, uh, I, I sometimes forget to get up and walk around, um, and I can go days without going actually outside the front door, which uh, all feels very strange for someone who's very used to being. Uh, packed in a bag quite often and uh, off somewhere in the world. Tell me about it. And uh, Mark, are the are the government regulations slacking down a little bit? Is is it getting better? Um, where I am, it's quite good actually, because Shropshire is the most rural county, so it's the least populated. <laughs> so there aren't actually that many people up here anyway. Mostly cheap. Um, <laughs> so you know that's that's pretty handy. Um, yeah. It's it. Everyone seems to be on the by and large. Everyone seems to be, you know, sticking to lockdown. Um, there's the odd peak and fluctuation where there seems to be more cars on the roads. But overall, I think everyone's just trying to ride it out and just looking forward to the day when we can actually go outside and try and talk to people normally. And uh, you, you were mentioning you were doing some homeschooling. Um, have you been into what? What have you been doing to entertain yourself and keeping the kids sane beyond that? <laughs> well. Um, luckily we've got a dog as well. Um, so Wicket has come to the fore, um, in giving us an escape when we go and take him for a walk. Um, and he's just good fun. At least it's just something to keep your mind off the, you know, monotony and everything. And then it's just, you know, it's like Dave was saying, really keeping yourself occupied with whatever work we can do through this medium, through emails, doing the website stuff. Um, but otherwise it's trying to keep away from this. <laughs> because it's all too easy to just start having one of these at any time of day because nothing matters anymore. Is it the weekend? Is it a school night? Who cares? Who cares? You agree there, Stephen? A absolutely. Uh, in fact, I just got a, a, a fresh delivery of uh, of beer arrived today uh, in preparation for uh, for being on air uh, today. Um yeah, so to be honest, it, it's the trampoline in the garden. We bought just before lockdown. We bought the trampoline for the kids, and uh, that has seen a lot of usage in the uh, in the last few weeks. I have to say, and I think we've been quite lucky that the weather has been fantastic here in the UK. Um, uh, ironically, so of course, you know, if it was tip, if it was, um, if it was, we were allowed out to go and do things, we wouldn't uh, have this nice weather. It'd be rainy and grey as it usually is. But as soon as we're not allowed out, well. You know, it is beautiful sunshine, summer-like weather, day in, day out. Yeah. Very frustrating. It, it's always like that, isn't it? Um, so uh, with all these pleasantries over, it's time to put you guys in the hot seat. So uh, may the fourth be with you. <laughs> it's uh, time for you, Mark and Steve, to come clean with the Dirty Dozen, okay? So um, we have 25 of uh, years of journalism that matters. And uh, before we go to the start of this uh, bromance story of the industry, uh, <laughs> I want you to tell us about your early introduction to diving. So, Mark, uh, let's start with you. What was your introduction to, to diving like and when? Um, I never really should have got into diving if you went the traditional route where it was, uh, you know, taken in by your, your immediate family. Uh, my mum doesn't swim and my dad barely snorkels. So, really, that was the end of it on that side of things. But luckily, my uncle, who's only nine years older than me, uh, he was heavily into his diving with his local Bezac club um, back in the day when they went wreck diving. And if you didn't come back with something shiny from the wreck, you hadn't gone on a proper wreck dive. Those <laughs> were the, you know, <laughs> back in the day when that was acceptable. Um, and then he also became a commercial diver. So he was a little bit of a hero to mm -hmm. me when I was growing up. And he was the one who put me in all of his equipment and rolled me off a boat in a bay in Anglesey into about six meters of water <laughs> after giving me the the uh, the wisdom of just keep this in your mouth and keep breathing as he pushed me over. That was it. And I ended up <laughs> on the bottom. Um, I remember laying there on my yeah. back a bit like a turtle, um, still breathing, thinking, well, thank, I'm thank alive. You. Rolled over onto my front, <laughs> crawled around on the bottom for a bit before he dragged me up to the top. And um, I was hooked then. That was it. It was just that that feeling of being underwater in that alien environment. And I've never looked back. Excellent. So what about you, Stephen? 
Well, you know, a remarkably similar story, actually. So I was um, I was on a holiday with my parents um, uh, in the Canary Islands, and um, uh, some I was around the pool being bored as eight year old boys can be, but on holiday with their parents, and um, some guy, which the way I remember it is, some guy in some uh, overly tight speedos uh, walking around the pool, going, "And we want to learn to scuba." <laughs> Um, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> a oh, lovely yeah, well, photo. <laughs> there's the photo. So that that's me in uh, that photo wearing um, speedos, and I apologise for viewers watching this at the moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, so this guy came around the pool, local dive centre, uh, was asking people if they wanted to try out uh, scuba diving, um, and my parents said to me, "Would you like to have a go?" And I went, "Yeah, that sounds like fun. Let's." I I'd always been involved in swimming. And doing fun things underwater uh, and in swimming pools, you know, all being all through my childhood. So, uh, wanted to have a go. They um, they put the cylinder uh, mask, reg, fins on me, chucked me in the uh, in the pool. I you know, floated to the bottom, uh, crawled around the bottom a bit like Mark's experience. Uh, although you know, <laughs> being a southerner rather than a northerner, I knew to be on my front rather than on my back at the start of the dive. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, so, and they they got me uh, swimming around. Uh, I think it was about ten minutes that they they had me underneath. And I remember um, sort of looking up and seeing them trying to signal to me to come back up. Uh, to which I was like, "This is amazing. I'm loving this. There's no way I'm going to go back up." So they actually had to come and send someone down to come and uh, come and get me off the bottom of the pool and bring me back up, um, uh, you know, out of the water, which uh, you know started my lifelong passion with uh, with diving. Excellent. Um, Mark, you were working as a sports journalist, but I hear your first job in the industry ruffled some feathers. What's the story uh, about that? Yeah, it did a little bit. Um, I started out as a newspaper journalist when I was 18, um, but obviously I've been diving since I was 12. Um, and then I applied for a job that I saw in the Press Gazette, which we used to get at our paper, um, that was basically had media jobs in around the world. And they said that they want an editor for a water sports magazine. So at the time, I didn't know it was a dive magazine, but I also kayaked. I can sail. Um, so I thought, I'm going to apply for that. Turned out that it was for Sport Diver. Uh, I went for the interview, got a real grilling with their publisher and their uh, CEO. <laughs> um, and they kind of put a question to me, and I had two ways of dealing with it. It was either tell them what they wanted to hear or tell them what I really thought. And it was, what would you do with a magazine? So I thought, well, I'll be a typical Yorkshireman and be honest. And I said, right, it needs more UK diving in. It needs more equipment. And just really told them what I'd like to do with it. Mm. It seemed to go pretty good. Um, and anyway, the next day I got a phone call from them saying, you're exactly what we're looking for. The job shows if you want it. So of course, jump to the chance, combine my job with my hobby. So it's perfect. Um, but... When I came in at that role, I was only 25. So yeah. at the time, that was the youngest dive magazine editor by something like 17 or 18 years. Um, now, I have to say the dive industry is incredibly friendly overall. And I was welcomed by a lot of people. And they really, really gave me a lot of assistance and help and support. But there was a few of the old guard who I don't think liked someone who was only 25 coming into a senior position in the media world of diving in the uk even though i've been diving for 13 years by that point um but it was just my age i think but the way i look at it is every time i see them they were getting older and i'd just say i'm still here <laughs> and fair enough 18 and a half years later highlights and lessons learned yeah i think the biggest thing i learned from coming into magazines from newspapers was a big shock because i was used to doing daily stories multiple daily stories and it was all very fast paced and suddenly yeah. going to a magazine and having three and a half four weeks to put a magazine together <laughs> it, it, to start with it was like i've got loads of time this is really really weird and i kept getting the magazine done in about a week and a half <laughs> so i managed to pace myself and it also allowed me to go on trips so i was doing probably 12 trips a year for about 15 mm. 16 years when i was at sport diver oh really nice um which was great, got me around the world, I have to say. But what I learned the most was that you have to keep things fresh, keep things moving. So in my period with Sport Diver, I think we went through four or five redesigns. Um, so that was four different mastheads. We changed the typeface inside, the style of it. 
brought new areas in every time we we did a redesign so there's new sections on free diving sections on tech diving etc cetera, etc cetera. and i think that that's the most important thing that i noticed you know there's other magazines out there that look the same as it did 20 years ago that just haven't changed yeah and i think that people get a bit bored it gets a bit stagnant so i tried to do that and that's what i've i've always had that ethos of keep it fresh keep it moving because if it keeps me interested then it should keep the readers interested as well you you say it's not stressful i mean you you asked me to do a couple of articles here and then and i'm i'm stressing out like a mother <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you've got to remember that I've been doing this since I was 18 yeah. for doing the newspaper stuff. Headlines tomorrow, been... Aaron. Let's go, go, go. Exactly. But I've been doing <laughs> magazines now for, what, you know, 22 and a half years. Yeah. So, yeah, it's like it's second nature for me now. Um, yeah, exactly. But, yeah, it still gets a bit stressful in the last week of deadline because there's always things that you're waiting for. But uh, People that you're waiting for. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to say anything, but mm, yeah. Uh, but no, it's it's it is it can be stressful, but then you also feel a real sense of uh pride when that magazine comes out and arrives through yeah. the door and you see the actual final printed format. So yeah, it's good. Just a short uh, further introduction to Scuba Diver magazine. So you and Ross brought your faces to Scuba Diver magazine. How explain how you now service Australia, New Zealand, the Americas and Canada. And of course, Europe with your different types of, of magazines. Yeah, well, that's it. So we started our own company up in t early 2017 um, and launched Scuba Diver magazine. Um, that mm -hmm. was servicing uh, the UK predominantly, uh, Malta and a little bit in Europe. Um, and the whole idea was keep it very neutral. So we work with all the training agencies. Um, we don't affiliate with anyone, totally independent. Um, but we've still got all the sections of sport diver that everyone liked. So there's stuff for beginners, intermediates, tech divers, advanced, um, lots of news, lots of equipment, et cetera, et cetera. So we did that for about 12 months. And then we decided to expand. So we looked at Australia and New Zealand as an over English speaking area with good diving. So we launched our Australia and New Zealand version down there. So they are both a monthly magazine. Mm -hmm. And then we just launched last year, we launched Scuba Diver Destinations, which is a quarterly title that services the US and Canada. And that's more of a, a travel related, very inspirational. Um, so it's got stuff that any level of diver can do, but then there's also the stuff to aspire to. So your bikini atolls, the truck lagoons, you know, stuff like that, <laughs> which you know, because you wrote that one. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, so between those three, we, and there it is, um, between those three titles, uh, you know, we cover a, a vast area and it's the main English speaking parts of the world. Excellent. Very nice. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction to that, uh, Mark. Uh, Stephen, can I get you back in there somewhere? Are you there? There he is. I'm still here, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, so tell, tell us a little bit about uh, Deeper Blue. Was, was that your first uh, job in the industry? Yeah, so um, uh, it was my first and only job, really, in the uh, in the diving industry. Um, unless you count being a, a dive instructor and chairman of my university diving club uh, as a job, which um, it certainly felt like it a lot of times, to be honest. Um, so you know, I, I set up Deeper Blue um, back at university when I when I um, I joined university in 1996. Um, and, uh, you know, it was probably what would be classed as a blog these days, um, which was a yeah. bunch of my personal stories. Uh, however, in those days it was before social media, it was before, uh, WordPress and all these cool technologies that you can do stuff now. Mm -hmm. uh, oh dear Lord. There's uh, there's a whole load of old versions of the website. In fact, the, the top <laughs> left one, the very blue of blue, uh, websites, um, yeah was was essentially the original version which was hand coded so it wasn't a couple of clicks and off you go you had to learn how to uh, actually code as well as be able to write which i'm pretty sure if you went back and read a lot of my my original writing it was pretty terrible um so uh so you know fast forward uh 23 24 years and uh you know it's got a lot easier uh you know publishing uh, and I'm much more about, um, you know, working with a very great team around the world, uh, publishing Brilliant. details about uh, about diving of all sorts. Um, but those early days uh, were very, very interesting. And uh, most of the team is 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 in the chat right now. I can see them making lots of comments. So hi guys. I can uh, see I can see a lot of comments as well. They they shall be uh, they shall be spoken to later. <laughs> 
Uh, so Deeper Blue started publishing stories about scuba diving, but free diving made a major impact on the site. So how did uh, that come about? Yeah, absolutely. So um, so as I said, it starts off as, as what would now be days called a blog. And it was about uh, my experiences scuba diving. So I, I was very lucky that I got into, after my eight-year-old uh, experience, uh, I, I started learning at school through the cadet force at school um and uh, assistant instructor at 16 uh you know instructor and chairman of my university diving club uh, at 18 those sorts of things so um but by the time uh, i started publishing i was publishing stories about scuba diving but i was very interested in how you get young people into into diving and into the industry mm -hmm. uh, and at the time what i thought was uh, snorkeling would be a good way of doing it it's relatively low cost um the barrier entry is is um, a lot lower than scuba diving, and for university students, that's ideal. It gets people into the water and experiencing it without needing to uh, go through the whole um, uh, scuba diver training side of things. So I started looking at ways of adding snorkeling content into uh, into Deeper Blue, uh, and I came across another site um, that was publishing snorkeling and free diving content, mm. uh, and I started teaming up. It was published by a guy called Cliff Etzel. Um, and, uh, you know, we teamed up together initially it was about just teaming up together. And then we amalgamated the sites in, in 1999, if I remember correctly. Um, and that's when we added in the forum as well. Uh, and at the time we were the only media organization that really covered free diving, um, with any seriousness. And, uh, it made uh, that the, the community, which was still pretty fledgling of modern free diving at that time. Uh, really flocked to us. We we did editorial, you know, articles and news about uh, free diving. But also, this was as I said before, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all the great social media that we use these days. Um, so the forums were really the the key way people communicated with each other around the world about free diving. And and how do you feel now, all these years later, with Deeper Blue in 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 twenty twenty, and 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 your user base? It must be so vastly different. Yeah, it is uh, very very different now. I, I remember those early days, um, looking at the logs of uh, you know people looking at the website. I'm like, ah, oh, that's my mum. Ah, oh, that's my <laughs> my friend from down the road. Uh, that's my teacher. You know, it was it was um, it was quite an interesting uh, experience. Cool circle. <laughs> publishing to the you know the ten people that read Deeper Blue in the first uh, the first year or so. Yeah. Um, now though, it is truly a global um, community. Um, to see has um, to see how much it has changed over the years. So we reach. Uh, over half a million people on social media. Uh, we reach uh, over a million page views a month uh, on the website and the mobile app. So it's uh, it, it's very different to looking at the three people down the road, and one of them being my mum. Uh, you know, <laughs> website. Um, so it's uh, it's amazing to see what an impact we can we can do when we publish something uh, on the website and see it being shared all over social media and people picking it up and being used by other um diving and non-diving media sites to talk about what's going on I, I mean i feel incredibly proud and it's it's not really me although i set it up and i do a lot of writing for it it's really an incredible incredible team of of uh journalists and moderators and helpers around the world who uh, who help out behind the scenes and thanks for that that it's a, it's a great story from uh, from a small project to something truly global um, it's time to pull in uh, Vic again. I mean, for those of you who don't know, Vic is on Team uh, Scuba Diver Magazine and Team Deeper Blue as well. And uh, since it's her birthday tonight, we thought it was appropriate to let her do the rounds uh, for the next <laughs> <laughs> next questions, as well as bring some questions in from the audience. So, uh, Vic, you can take it from here. Hey, Mark, Steve. So, come on, Mark, Steven, who introduced you and who is responsible for the sweet romance? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it was actually my first deputy editor uh, who was responsible for unleashing this dodgy duo on the world. Um, she'd met Stephen and had said, you should meet my editor. You'd get on really, really well with him. Uh, and then it was only a couple of months later, there was the annual DEMA trade show. And 
uh, that I was shambling down one of the aisles after a particularly heavy night of socializing and networking. Um, and coming towards me was a similarly pale looking ghostly apparition. And I remember that we kind of saw one another and at the same time, it was a bit like, hang on a minute. And then that was it. We were kind of sealed at that moment that uh, we were brothers from another mother. Aww. Absolutely. That's nice. Did you guys develop a friendship from then? You stayed friends. Did you start working alongside each other or? Shall I pick that one up, Mark? Yeah, you can pick that one up, Mark. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so I don't think we immediately, although we became good friends, we didn't immediately uh, turn into bosom pals and work together. Um, we, we sort of hung out quite a lot in the, in the dive show circuit for quite a while. Um, <laughs> with me dressed up as a Smurf, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, it, it was kind of a couple of years later that we, because I think that, that show was 2002, if I remember rightly, Mark, um, yeah. in Las Vegas. And it was kind of a couple of years later, we really started to, to form a good friendship and were looking at doing diving together. So um, we we had a particularly epic trip to Egypt, uh, which I think was probably the, the real sealing the deal uh, on uh, becoming the the bromance that it is um your words not mine vic by the way um, <laughs> and uh, and uh you know we we had a fantastic trip to, to egypt uh did a lot of amazing diving uh, uh, uh you know maybe one or two late nights um and uh, yeah we we found we had you know very similar stories you know you've heard the background story of how we both got into diving we're very similar um you know, and we we uh, both work in in the diving media side of things. And please stop showing that photo of me <laughs> in the <your> diving <laughs> And uh, you're and, welcome. Um, it, it it really did become friends, and we've collaborated ever since. Um, and I think, in particular, when it became Scuba Diver Magazine as opposed to Sport Diver, is where we really started because. Um, uh, you know, Mark had more freedom being it's his own, uh, you know, being the publisher of the magazine as well as uh, as the editor. He had more freedom to do stuff. So we teamed up to do the free diving section, for example, in the magazine um, and, you know, do the occasional road trip together as well. Excellent. So you talk about Egypt. Uh, what was the price like back then? Was it all expenses paid trips or tell us about your, your media hookups? Go on, Mark. Yeah, well, that one, this this was back in the day a little bit when there used to be a bit more like that. Although I hasten to add, not every trip was ever um, of all expenses paid. Everyone always assumes that you get wined and dined everywhere you go, but generally that is not the case. But in this respect, it was. It was a 20th anniversary of a big centre out in Egypt. They were flying me out, and it was literally everything was covered. Food, drinks, the dive-in, accommodation, everything. And at the time, I thought, well, if I'm going out, it makes sense. I'm in a room on my own. So I proposed the idea of Steve coming out as well because he can put stuff on Deeper Blue, gives them extra coverage and everything. Basically, the idea was that me and him could have a cracking trip and it didn't cost us anything. Um, and it worked perfect because they got coverage in my magazine, got cover on Deeper Blue. But also, we just had a fantastic trip. Um, and like Steve said, that did sealed a deal really um on us uh being lifelong friends then lovely you guys have visited uh fiji together as well haven't you was that another press trip that one was all down to stephen <laughs> well yeah so that the fiji trip um i had won a competition um uh for a trip to uh, for two to um uh, to fiji uh and uh after careful discussion with uh, mrs uh, w uh, we decided that dragging kids uh, to literally the other side of the planet was not the um, not the best thing to do. So uh, we said, "Well, what? Who else would be? Who could you take?" And I went, "Mark is definitely the guy I'm going to take on this trip." Um, and although it was supposed to be for a consumer punter uh, going and enjoying a, a, a week long holiday in Fiji, um, it ended up being converted into a press trip which uh which was amazing to be honest although we only actually spent four days diving on the island it took us about three days to get there uh, and about three days to get back and only four days actually in the water on the uh, on island but it was some amazing amazing diving we did uh, some of the very famous shark diving uh, out in fiji mm -hmm. um uh, including a a rather frisky uh three meter or so tiger shark that was uh 
uh, you know, sensing the bromance between us, I think, and, uh, <laughs> and wanted to come and uh, join in. <laughs> yeah, it, was quite, it was quite interesting on that dive because we were doing the bull sharks, which is what Fiji's known for. Um, obviously, they're, you know, the big two, two and a half meter bull sharks, and they're impressive in their own right. Um, we'd gone into the water after all of the normal guests had gone in uh, and we're kind of hanging on one end of the row, if you like, behind a little coral wall, just watching what was going on with the bull sharks, taking a few photographs. And then this, this tiger shark just came steaming over the top of us. And as Steve said, it was rather frisky. It was just going wild. All the bull sharks scattered and this tiger shark kept closing its eyes and just getting quite, it was getting quite aggressive to get its own way. And then for some reason, I don't know if it was the sound of my strobes, but it took a particular interest in where we were. Um, <laughs> and the wranglers were having to get quite, uh, you know, a few of them involved to keep it moving away from us. Um, and all I remember at the time is there's me with my aquatica housing, with my arms out and the strobe and everything, taking still shots. And Steve was using a little tiny paralens. I just remember that I looked over and I saw him taking the lanyard off his wrist to hold the, just the paralens in his hand and thinking, what's he doing? Anyway, we were taking some shots and everything. Really enjoyed it. The shark went after about 10 minutes. We were like, you know, looking at one another underwater, like, hey, that was fantastic and everything. When we looked at the footage later on, he got some amazing shots of the sharks swimming around us. But one awesome shot is coming straight towards me. You see my flashes go off as I'm taking a photograph of it. And then just as it got to the point where it was coming over the top, would have been awesome footage. It all goes dark as he bends down behind me. And I remember saying to him, what did he do then? And he was like, it's all right for you. You were hiding behind your main camera. I only had a power lens. It's the size of a little torch. What was I going to do? So yeah. to be fair, I can understand that, but it would have made an awesome video. Oh, yeah. Well, obviously, I was just going to donk it on the nose uh, with my power lens, which is why I took the lanyard off uh, to make sure that uh, I could sacrifice uh, probably a good portion of my arm as well as the power lens in case I needed to. <laughs> Excellent. We're getting a lot of comments from Team Deep of Blue here. Um, <laughs> John B. Griffiths wants to know, what was your worst dive? I know Mark's got a funny story. Maybe you can kick us off with that, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Um, this was long before I got into the diving industry. This is when I was just diving for a hobby. Uh, and we were in the Lake District and we were doing a drift dive down one of the rivers now normally it's just a nice gentle dive you go down with the current you sometimes see salmon coming up past you and it's just a, it's just a really cool dive in inland uh, this particular time it had been very stormy and so the flow was quite strong and so we went down a little faster than normal and it had created quite big eddies as the river went back and forth and i got shot into one of these eddies at speed and unfortunately something else had drifted downstream and it was a sheep that had obviously died many many days before and had swelled up to about the size of a cow and i came around the corner and hit it very hard and embedded myself up to my waist head first inside this sheep um it will be forever known as sheep gate after that um, all I remember is fighting my way out of the inside of it, had intestines around me and everything. My buddy was just falling about laughing because he thought it was hilarious. And uh, all I can say, I could just, I can still taste it through the regulator, even though I clamped down on that regulator harder than anything, you could still get the taste through. Believe me, it's not good. I wouldn't advise it. Good advice. And the uh, editor, <laughs> John Liang, Steve, uh, what's your favourite dive site in the UK? Where do you want to go diving when we get out of lockdown? <laughs> well, I've got lots of favourite dives, um, but uh, I, I have to probably give a shout out to Stony Cove because, as I described I, at university, I was the, uh, the, the chairman and lead instructor for the university club. And uh, it was based in Leicester, which Stony Cove is uh, an inland quarry just uh, by Leicester. So I've probably got about 800 dives logged in Stony Cove. So, uh, you know, it's uh, it's got a very dear space, place in my heart um, slash, you know, dream, bad dreams of too many times trying to get a student to do some drills on the uh, the, the shelf there. So um, so that's probably, you know, to be honest, depending on how long we've been out of the water, it's probably going to be something like my first dive is, uh, is somewhere boring like um, Stony Cove or Raysbury. Sorry, Stony Cove and Raysbury, you, you are amazing places as well. But um, 
uh, you know, going somewhere to just do some checkout dives, I think, first of all. Sounds like a good plan. Cool, guys. Thanks very much. I'll be back with some more questions. <laughs> See you in a bit, Vic. All right. Let's, uh, let's get back to it. Uh, Stephen, let's start with you. Um, what, was your, what was your biggest uh, news story that you had during all these years? Um, so we, we've had a few pretty big news stories. Um, I'll be honest, the ones that end up being the biggest, unfortunately, end up being the ones that are the saddest at the same time. So the one that probably made us from a um, journalistic perspective was uh, back in 2002 when Audrey Mestre, um, who, is a, who was a world champion freediver, uh, married to Pipin Ferreras, um, uh, sadly passed away whilst uh, on a world record attempt. Um, and has been the subject of uh, a number of books and and TV documentaries and so on. And uh, at the time, uh, we were covering the the news pretty much live um, from the Dominican Republic. We had a, a journalist on the ground there, so we could cover it uh, quite extensively. Um, and that went properly viral, as uh, things do these days. So it became major news stories for mainstream media around the world, um, and we were being interviewed and, and asked to support the story uh, by all sorts of, of media that is outside the diving industry. Um, we've had a number of other um, examples of that, uh, probably one of the more recent ones, again, um, Natalia Molchanova uh, in 2015, when she sadly went missing off the coast of Ibiza. Again, um, we, we covered that uh, pretty much live and... Uh, having a distributed uh, sort of journalist base uh, across the world allows us to do that and often mm -hmm. have people on the ground very close to where these things happen. Um, so uh, it, it, it's it's satisfying to be able to help get the news out to people in those circumstances, but very, very sad because often these people are people that you know, we personally know as well. Yeah, the yeah. fraternity mm -hmm. is very, very small and... Um, uh, and in fact, I ended up on a lot of uh, mainstream uh, uh, sort of uh, primetime news channels, um, certainly in the UK uh, and in the US, talking about what happened. Uh, and they had obviously picked up on the fact that I knew Natalia and had, had met her when she first came on the scene back in 2003. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that was quite a quite a hard thing to do. Yeah, I can imagine. On, on the other side, we do get some fun stuff as well. So. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we we published a, a news item back in uh, tail end of last year uh, with a conversation uh, with Kirk Croc, who is yeah. <laughs> international, and uh, he um, uh, so he had talked about Avatar Two, which he's been working on behind the scenes uh, as part of the stunt team and training people. He has um, he said that it's going to probably be the most significant diving movie ever made based on all the work that's going on behind the scenes so yeah. um so that ended up becoming a server melting uh you, you know millions upon millions of people reading and sharing that story and it was actually only a new story of you know a few hundred words essentially but it was giving some insight into what was happening with avatar 2 and working with people like kate winslet for example so um so that was uh, something different uh, and yeah. quite cool to uh, to see go viral I was trying to get a hold of him today without luck, though, because I bet he's busy. But he's always he's also way on the west coast, uh, so time difference is quite significant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but having said that, uh, guys that are watching, um, Kirk is going to be coming on uh, after our season break, uh, so stay tuned if you want to catch him on there. Uh, Mark, uh, can I get you back in here some somehow? <laughs> Where are you? There he is. I'm okay, back. Excellent. <laughs> so uh you well I, I want Stephen also to come back in yeah <laughs> so you're, you're both actually regulars on the on the show scene so uh why why do you think dive shows are important I'll let you start Mark and what does COVID-19 mean for the upcoming dive shows you think yeah well I mean I'm obviously very close to dive shows as in the other part of the business as well as scuba diver magazine we launched the go diving show um and we just had our second one this year in February um, I think dive shows will always have a place because diving is a very, there's a lot of camaraderie in diving. You know, obviously there's a buddy system and this, that and the other, but 
they just it's a very friendly sport and everybody mm. enjoys talking to one another about diving about what equipment they've got etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think that's where the shows are a great thing because you can have that face-to-face -face contact um what we tried to do with a go diving show as amply displayed by that photograph is get yeah. some big name speakers there now this was steve backshall from deadly 60 and expeditions and he was our keynote speaker and i've never seen a crowd as big as we had for him when he was talking on stage i mean it just filled all the seats and then was just spreading down all the aisles and everything it was amazing <laughs> um and i think that's the, that is the key thing that basically sums up shows in one hit is that you can see these people who are you know the heroes that you see on tv or film and you get to meet them face to face um you know all, all four of our keynote speakers monty andy miranda and steve mm. they were they were great they were all sat there um doing a book signing chatting to people you know whether they were young kids experienced divers whatever and they would take the time to talk to them there is and he was this little kid i mean you can see his face yeah. look at him he's absolutely made up um and I think that's that's the main thing is you've you've got the chance to meet these stars of TV, but then also you, we've got the smaller stages, so you've got the chance to meet you know the stars of the tech diving world, mm -hmm. your photography gurus, stuff like that. So it's nice to have the face to face time with them. Plus, when you've got equipment manufacturers there, you can go and find out about the new gear direct from them. So that's nice that you can see all the new new stuff and actually get to feel it. There's nothing better than when you see new shiny gear that you can actually get it in your hands and have a good look at it and find out the inside track on how it was made. Um, same with if you're looking at where you're going to go on your next trip. Yeah. Again, there's nothing that beats face-to-face -face talking to your dive specialist tour operators, telling them what you want to see, Indeed. what's the best time to go. <laughs> you know, you know all about that. Yeah, um, no, I, was just, I was just looking at the stage and I saw Andy Torbett was, was there, one of the main speakers. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, it just so happens that Andy's actually coming with us to Truck Lagoon in March next year, and Stephen Whelan will also be on that trip uh, covering uh, the expedition. So uh, yet another shameless plug in the middle of the episode. <laughs> you can go on our website and inquire on dirtydustnextpedition.com. <laughs> anyway, let's let's go back to it. So um, the Go Diving Show, obviously, was last year. Uh, it's It's an epic show. It brings the life back into the UK dive show scene. How do you see the future developing for for the Go Diving Show? Well, I mean, we it, the this was this year two, uh, February of this year, um, and it was a nice growth on the on our inaugural show from last year. Um, so we were, you know, we were really looking forward to next year. And then obviously, COVID nineteen arrived. Um, we were very lucky that we got our show out at the end of February. Mm. And COVID-19 really only started kicking in, you know, a couple of weeks later. So we, we managed to dodge that bullet. Um, but I do think that going forward, there is going to be a hiatus on shows purely because I think we're going to have social distancing around for a while. Yeah. Um, and who knows when large group gatherings are actually going to be sanctioned. Yeah. So, you know, you've got that issue with the actual footfall of people going to visit. Um, on the exhibitor side of things, the vast majority are flying in from abroad. So then that adds in the extra element of what countries are still going to be in quarantine. Is there going to be quarantine coming into yeah. different countries? What are, What's the flight scene going to be like? The mayor of the local cities, do, are they letting people have big congregations? You yeah, know, so there's, there's, a, uh, yeah, sorry. there's a lot going on. And I think yeah. that that's the thing is it's, it's just it, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. I do think shows will be back because I do think that they are vital for that face-to-face -face contact. Um, but I do think that we're just going to see potentially months where there is nothing happening. And then it might even be towards the back end of next year or even into 2022 that we start seeing things getting back to some semblance of normality. So Stephen, what, what do you think? You know, you, 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 you have, uh, some, some, uh, some people behind the scenes, you, you know, all the latest scoops, uh, you know, the, the fingers are crossed for New Orleans this year, but I'm not sure if it's looking too good. What do you think? Yeah, so uh, honestly, I don't think we know at this point in time, and I, I think it would be unfair to, uh, you know, pass any judgment on whether uh, shows later in uh, tail end yeah, of this course. year um, will, will go on. Um, I, I know that, um, you know, I echo what Mark said, which is I think the – um, both local restrictions, air travel, budgets for 
manufacturers, um, exhibitors, and so on. If you take, um, uh, you know, the the Dima show in New Orleans, you know, a large number of the exhibitors there are small independent dive centers, essentially, or, or small businesses. Uh, and they're the ones that are going to be suffering really hard at this moment in time with, um, with COVID-19. And um, I think it's just going to, uh, we just need to wait and see. We need to see how soon things start opening up, depending on where you live uh, and how bad things are. Um, you know, we need to see how quickly the the major manufacturers and retailers and, and um, travel companies uh, open up their marketing budgets as well. Um, uh, it, it's it's just something you need to wait and see, unfortunately. Um, I, I do think that um, this year is going to be a struggle, I think, for, for most shows. Mm. Um, and I think depending on uh, the, the one thing actually we haven't mentioned is consumer and um, uh, business trade confidence people willing to get on planes in close proximity yeah. to other people um you go to these shows where there are you know eight nine ten twelve thousand people in close proximity to each other uh, are people going to be willing to want to do that i think i think it's going to be a really uh hard thing to call right now because we're in the midst of it we just need to see how things start um improving over the next period of time absolutely i completely agree and uh, th there's been so much positivity all that aside in the diving industry this people have been very creative coming up with lots of new ideas uh, I, I was just looking through my iPhone uh, a few days ago and I saw uh, deeper blue uh, had a had a major update uh, for their for their app so uh, that you you've been hard at work I can see and there's some also something else that's new do you want to tell us about this Stephen? <laughs> yeah so um so the the app is is uh is new it's a refresh from from a previous app we had um it's a way of being able to get all your latest news features um we have a, a whole bunch of guides as well on there about beginners guides to free diving scuba diving um travel destinations those sorts of things so um it's seeing a tremendous amount of traction people seem to really like it which is fantastic because uh, we are all about trying to get the latest things into people's hands uh, as mm -hmm. far as news and, and uh, content's concerned. Um, the other thing that I think you're referring to is uh, we are <laughs> launching a new podcast uh, towards the middle of May. Um, and this is going to be, oh, we've got a little crawler along the bottom of the screen. I like this. <laughs> so uh, I don't think I've seen this one before. So it's good. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, a uh, little distracting, though I have to say. Um, no, so it's um, so the podcast middle of middle of May, um, and it's going to be a, a, unlike a lot of other podcasts, which do a fabulous job um, around sort of more long form interview uh, style, or it's it's sort of a, a couple of guys talking, um, you know, backwards and forwards, Make which I think one. they're all amazing. Uh, we're <laughs> trying to do a um, something slightly different, which is a sort of news magazine format show. Sure. So it's going to be a little bit of commentary about what's going. So what is going on in the world uh, at the moment? Uh, commentary around uh, around that. There's going to be um, uh, little short stories with um, with people in the diving industry and outside the diving industry that that the audience might feel are interesting. Uh, and then we'll also be bringing in the community as well, so they can help. Um, yeah, talk about their favourite dive destinations or you know how close they got to sheep in whilst diving in wales for example <laughs> so it's uh, you know we, there were all sorts of interesting stories that we want to try and bring in so um so yeah look out for that that's coming out um towards the uh, the middle of the month excellent nice one Stephen. uh mark i want to get back to you for a little bit uh, you you haven't been publishing now in these uh, corona times your print version uh is the magazine coming back once uh, covid calms down a little bit as i think your loyal print readers need you and I need to publish some articles. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, for sure. Um, I mean, we do a digital version of the magazine as well. Um, yeah. So we pretty much cover, um, you know, whichever way anyone wants to um, digest our content, they can get it on, the, you know, we've got a website for all three of our regions we cover. We've got the um, digital versions for all three. Um, but people still like a tangible product. There are a lot of people out there who still like Absolutely. having a dive magazine. So they can have it lying around the house. It's kind of a statement. I'm a diver. When they have friends around, they can pick it up, flick through it. It's got lovely pictures in there, you know, and all that sort of thing. Um, the main way that we distribute the magazine is we put it out into dive centers so that people have to go into the dive centers to pick it up. That way it's, it's pushing 
people through the door of the dive centers, gives a dive center owner a chance to, you know, have a chat with them, potentially sell them equipment, courses, whatever, but at least have that monthly contact. Yeah. Um, obviously, with the lockdown, all the dive centers are closed at the moment. Um, so our route to market, we do have direct subscription as well, but our, our main thing we try to do is push people into the dive centers. Um, so because the lockdown has got the dive centers closed at the moment, there was just no point in trying to put the magazine out. We can't get it into the hands of divers. So we just put it on hold until we can get it going again in a month or two. Um, but it will be back um, with all the content that everyone expects. But in the meantime, we've been keeping ourselves occupied because we launched yeah. Scuba Diver Live, um, which <laughs> is, oh, there we go. And we're on tomorrow night when I'm talking to John Kendall and Phil Short. Um, we're having a chat with them. And then we have Excellent. a session on a Friday afternoon, which is more linked to travel, manufacturers, design, and things like that. So mm -hmm. you can tune into that on Facebook and on our YouTube channel. Um, and it's basically any way of keeping uh, divers occupied, keeping them inspired. Exactly like what you're trying to do with this, Aaron. It's just while people yeah. are locked up, we don't want them disappearing off and getting into other sports or other activities. Let's keep them occupied and, and hooked on diving. And, and you, you see, you know, you, you guys are the professionals and you actually had this idea in mind for quite some time. I've just been running around like a donkey and trying to come up with something uh, to keep myself busy while in these Corona times. And it brings up a question that Jacob uh, from Paralens was asking in the comment section, which I'll read out to both of you. I don't think I've seen the diving industry being more online than it is at the moment. What do you see this forced to innovate effect bring about for the future of the diving industry and do you think it could outweigh the negative impact we are seeing today uh so let me go first on that one so uh, i think it's been amazing seeing how the whole diving community has has embraced uh engagement online uh th there's only there's a slight negative which is i i i'm what I say to people in the industry is we're suffering a little bit from webinaritis, where uh, <laughs> everyone is uh, is doing a webinar, and they're going and we to make sure that we find something um, to keep the audience interested. Because at the moment they could spend literally all night every day trying to listen to webinars about diving, which is mm -hmm. it's great. But if they're all pretty much the same, it's going to be quite hard for people to differentiate and decide they want to continue to listen to it. So we need to we need to innovate. So um uh you know your your thing Mark about doing something which is a bit different which is fireside plus travel. Um you know Aaron you're doing stuff around uh you know big names in the industry uh, fourth element are doing things like underwater bathtub, uh, yeah. bathtub underwater photo photography competition where I saw was being judged <laughs> today. Um, th those sorts of things. I think we need to continue to innovate and I, I, we need to make sure that um, the industry continues to think outside the box. Don't get, don't get too comfortable thinking that because you're putting on a webinar uh, for some people, which is a topic that you might be interested in is actually going to, uh, you know, be of interest to, uh, divers, because they will probably get bored quite quickly if we're not careful. Couldn't agree more. Mark, any thoughts? For the yeah, no, I, I kind of echo what Steve said, really. Um, you know, that's it. It's good to see the innovation. Um, I just think, in some respects, it's a little bit of a shame that it's taken COVID-19 to actually yeah, bring true. this out in the diving industry, because we've been under fire from the likes of kite surfing and wakeboarding and triathlons and mountain biking and all these other sports that are perceived to be more cool adrenaline mm. whatever and diving's kind of lagged a little bit behind them and i think that sometimes there's been a little bit too much infighting going on in the diving world where the training agencies think the other training agencies are the issue and it you know it's it's all this like infighting when really we're all in the diving world together so if we can grow the diving world there's more people in there for everybody then and the real issue is getting people into diving and not losing them to some of these other sports. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's great that we're seeing this innovation and everything. And let's just, you know, keep the ball rolling. Yeah. When we come out the other side of COVID-19 and we're able to get back in the water, you know, slowly but surely start to get back into traveling, mm -hmm. get back to whatever the new norm will be. Um, let's hope the dive industry keeps this, you know, this whole thinking outside the box. Let's innovate. 
uh, and really take the fight to some of these other sports that have been taking away potential divers. I couldn't agree more. It's all about reaching a new audience at this point. Hopefully some of the younger new divers, because we've all been in this sport since we were young, but it feels like the industry is not encouraging the young ones to join us enough. I mean, the average age at a DEMA show just keeps climbing and climbing. So, uh, Mark, uh, what sort of things have you done to encourage the children of tomorrow? And what advice do you have for both people that need some tips on how to encourage them? Um, well, if we look at the, uh, the the kids' side of things first, I've got kind of my hand in that one properly because my son is now 13 and a half. Yeah. Um, and he's been snorkeling since he was three. Um, he did sassy when we were out in um, Bonaire when he was five and a half. Um, he did his first bubble maker dive in a shark tank in Blue Planet Aquarium just as he turned eight. Um, he's now a junior advanced open water diver. He's dived in Bahamas, Bonaire, Grenada, Malta, as well as in the UK. Um, so it's great because I can see the the look on his face when he comes back from a dive and I can capture that excitement and everything. And it does remind me of what it was like when I first started diving. Mm -hmm. Although, like I said, I still get a buzz out of jumping into a puddle these days, even though I've got thousands <laughs> of dives. So I'm still like a big kid at heart. But it is great to see, you know, in a child's eyes. And so that led me to really want to try and get more kids involved because if we can't get more younger people into diving, we're going to be in trouble. So um, there's a section in the magazine called The Next Generation, which, as the title suggests, is aimed at kids and teenagers mm -hmm. because there's nothing better than having children – telling their stories, how they got into diving and why they love it so much to to be read by other children because then it's peer-to-peer. -peer. It's not us adults saying diving's cool, you want to do it because that's immediately going to get them thinking, well, what are you telling me that for? Um, so I think that that's been, a, that's been great. The, the uh, response we've had to the next generation is phenomenal. Uh, I had lots of uh, families come to see me at the Go Diving show saying that their kids had got in, had read stuff in there and that had led them into diving. Um, and let the go diving show, we had the cave, as you can see there, a little kid in, which was the nearest yeah. you're going to get to cave diving on dry land. <laughs> uh, we had a massive tri-dive pool, which we had loads of kids through. We had a climbing wall. We had virtual reality dives that they could do. And I just think it's really important to get kids into it. The other thing is that diving is one of those sports that can be done as a family. It's a bit like the only other one, really, that's very similar is skiing. Um, in that you can go away on a family trip and you could all dive together. So it's a real family bonding experience. Um, so I do think it's important to get, you know, the kids involved with diving. And that's what we've tried to do to make it accessible. And Steve, I want to get a little bit back to you as well. What, why do you think uh, free diving gets more attention than scuba diving? And how can we raise the scuba diving profile more as a diving community? Yeah, great question, Aaron. So, um, so look, so scuba diving for best will in the world is is a little bit boring for youngsters these days. Um, th there are, I mean, there are people who are passionate about scuba diving. Don't get me wrong, um, but it's not quite the same as it was thirty years ago when it was an element of danger. There was uh, scuba diving was you know Bond villains and James Bond was out you know. You know, going against the baddies, and then would you know come out out his dry suit in his in his tuxedo and off to a dinner party clinking martinis. You, you know, it was an element of cool around it. It just we we've scuba diving is a relatively uh, safe and easy sport, which is fantastic in one aspect, but it also doesn't really appeal to a younger generation the way that let's say free diving does. So free diving, although is is just as safe as um, scuba diving. Um, it has an element of danger involved with it. You know, you're going mm -hmm. to potentially much deeper depths. You're holding your breath. Um, people don't, um, you know, we've got all these heroes as well. So uh, there are people who are generally very fit, um, generally very good looking. I'm like Mark and myself on this, uh, <laughs> as you can see, you know. So, um, uh, you know, in usually beautiful destinations, very Instagrammable type stuff. And if you Absolutely. look at where young people are engaging, um, it tends to be platforms such as Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok and those sorts of places, which um, are all about um, be looking, you know, beautiful destinations, doing something fun and quirky, um, being a hero, th those sorts of things, which 
the scuba diving industry needs to find heroes. It's got a few of them, um, but uh, it, it's not as Instagrammable as um, free diving is, which I think is why you find more of the young youngsters these days gravitating towards free diving than scuba diving. I think it's a very good point. And, and that brings me uh, to uh, one of our final questions of tonight. Um, is there any career advice that you can give to a free diver or diver or, or anybody who wants to work in the industry, the two of you? Go. <laughs> um, I think the first thing, because that's one thing I always wanted to do, because I got into the industry very young, Yeah. Um, was that I wanted to get other people that chance, really. You know, I knew how lucky I was to come into that position at 25. Um, and the one thing I've noticed was all the dive magazines tended to have the same writers, the same photographers, and they're all getting older. And I thought, well, if no new people get the chance, we're going to run out of divers as they get older and retire. So I was always up for giving new people a chance and getting them in. So certain writers have been with me now for 20 plus years because I gave them their first chance and they've stuck with me, which is really nice. Mm. Um, but it's perseverance. I think that is the best thing I can say to people is Couldn't if you get one. shot down the first time and the 10th time and the 20th time, just keep trying. Um, you know, don't write about diving on the Thistlegorm because everyone and their dog's written about that and done it. <laughs> Try and find a unique angle. Um, if you've got it, it might be a regular dive site that you're doing, but you've just got a different approach to it. And if you can find something that's that's got that unique little touch, and you've got really nice pictures to back it up, just keep chipping away because someone will give you a break. And then once you're through the door, it definitely makes a difference, but it's just stick with it. I think that's probably the best piece of advice I can give. Couldn't agree more. What about you, Stephen? I thought Mark was going to say, don't do it. Was uh, I thought. <laughs> was, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I always remember uh, Is that having <laughs> lunch with um, uh, Sarah Richard, who's the founder of Girls That Scuba. Um, yeah, I think she's here. <laughs> uh, I've, I've seen a few comments on there and uh, uh, on the chat. And sorry, Sarah, I did mean guys and girls. Just to uh, she, she did pull me up on that one. Um, but it's uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, but I remember she sat down. It was it was uh, a little while, probably a year or so after Girls at Scuba had had started. And she said, "Look, you've been around the industry for a while. What's your advice?" And I went, "Don't do it. Don't don't start a content platform." uh on you know tongue in cheek obviously but and um uh i don't really i don't really mean that and, and in all seriousness you know that there's a lot of opportunity at the moment for uh people to get involved certainly from a diving media perspective there's some um there's some fabulous opportunities um the there's like the relic scholar for example the uh, world underwater uh, relic scholarship uh, and internships which give um young people an opportunity to mm -hmm. to get into diving and try lots of different things um uh you know there are more progressive media organizations like um scuba dive magazine and deeper blue which uh actively will work with people who don't necessarily have um a lot of experience in industry and in fact the majority of my team started from no experience and giving them an opportunity to uh, to write um so i i you know i, I think seek out and, and try and work with um you know friendly uh, media savvy organizations it doesn't have to be a magazine it doesn't have to be you know a website uh, a blog anything like that you there, there are uh, you know travel organizations dive destinations um you know equipment manufacturers who who are looking for people to who are savvy and enthusiastic to to get involved and absolutely try and um, you know persevere as Mark says, but mm -hmm. um, innovate and be uh, you know get a, think about how you can do ingenious things uh, that might spark some interest in the uh, in the diving world. A and one other final thing, sorry, just to say, no, no problem. Um, you know, it's we we all need to be ocean ambassadors. So people who. Uh, have a passion about the ocean and the things that we can do to help um, look after this planet. And you know, by going underwater, we are end up being ocean ambassadors and championing the um, uh, the, the the fate of so many uh, things underwater. Um, mm -hmm. You know, do that, and you will see. Uh, you yeah, know, media organizations are very interested in that sort of stuff, but also you will get a real audience with um, certainly young people around the world these days, in, in my view. 
It's excellent advice. Thank you so much for it, Stephen. Um, I think uh, we have some last minute uh, questions from Vic uh, before we round this <laughs> up. I'm sure she's got some yeah, good Lord. ones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what do you got for us, Vic? I've got a question from uh, John B. Griffith. Just diving in cold water in, of the UK and having to wear a hood caused the hair loss. Asking for a friend, he says. I don't know what he possibly means. I know, right? <laughs> uh, may, may, I, may I point out that uh, that unlike, unlike uh, where are you? Unlike unlike you, Mark, uh, that this is uh, this is due to Clippers rather than. Uh, rather than to I haven't other. given up yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes us more streamlined. Cuts your sack rate down. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. And uh, just one last one for both of you. Quick fire question: Any places that you haven't yet dived that you're keen to visit? From John Leanne. Chuck Lagoon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I was I was going to say Truck Lagoon, but uh, but Aaron, you've already got that one uh, sewn up uh, for me. So so let me put this one out there, Aaron. Uh, bikini is the one after truck that I'd like to do. <laughs> nice one, guys. Cool, guys. Uh, Thanks for that, Vic. <laughs> okay, I think uh, we kind of reached the end of our uh, our time and our questions, actually. So um, I think I'd just like to take the opportunity and say uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Stephen, for uh, coming clean with uh, the Dirty Dozen. It was, a, it was a pleasure to have you on board. I had a lot of fun. Uh, we go back way, way long, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you for a, for a cold drink uh, somewhere out there <laughs> soon, hopefully. Sounds good. Thank Absolutely. you for having us. <laughs> nice one. See you later, guys. Cheers. Cheers. All right. I think uh, that, that rounds up the sixth uh, episode of Coming Clean with the Dirty Dozen. Uh, this episode uh, will be on our YouTube channel tomorrow, where all the other five episodes are as well, should you want to join. Uh, we're also setting up uh, a podcast system. I think you can catch it on Spotify already. Uh, please remember to subscribe to either one, click on the notification bell uh, to be notified when new videos come online. Um, I just want to share with you a quick uh, fact here. We are taking a break now for a week. So the next episode is actually not until next Monday. So just keep that in mind that Thursday there will be nothing going on. But next Monday we have a very good friend of ours joining us, SJ Alice Bennett. Uh, she was one of the headlines at Tech Dive USA this year, um, or supposed to be. And she's going to be talking to us about her, her fantastic presentation, Capturing Shadows Underground. So me and SJ actually go way back. And, but if you follow her pictures online, her cave photography, it is absolutely astonishing. So uh, if you're into underwater photography uh, and you want to find maybe some secrets, I think this talk would be fantastic for you. Uh, it will be on Monday, the 11th of May at 7 p.m. GMT. 8 p.m. in London, 3 p.m. Uh, in New York. So I'm your host, Aaron Angramson. Stay safe in these wild times. Take care of yourself and each other. And if you feel lonely, we're here to chat dirty. See you later, guys. <laughs>